The topic for today's lecture are lattice vibrations, and we'll be talking about how to describe the lattice vibrations, so-called phonons, for solid-state physics. And we will try to do that, as uh, always, with an oversimplified model, which we can understand the basics, we can understand how things work, how they are derived, and then uh, without explicitly showing the generalization to 3D real crystals, you can imagine how the thing proceeds and how probably the uh, phonon relationships work in real crystals. So let us start by taking so-called harmonic approximation by trying to expand the total energy with respect to displacement of atoms. Why displacement? Well, if you think about lattice vibrations, this is nothing else than trying to describe a time evolution of position of an atom. We do not want to describe any diffusional processes. So eventually we are aiming at describing displacements of atoms around their equilibrium positions. You have a total energy of a system uh, written here as E, and it is a function of, of course, the positions and species of all the atoms, but also uh, a function of displacements of individual atoms, right? Now the coordinates alpha one and J one describe the uh, atom number and the direction of the atom. So you can think about alpha as numbering the atoms one, two, three, two, infinity, and J as uh, labeling them uh, X, Y, and Z, All right? So we have here a different displacement components. Now in this Taylor expansion, we are obviously missing the linear term. Does anyone have an idea? Why are we missing it here? Any brave one to answer aloud? Well, think about what we do, right? We want to say that we expand it around equilibrium. Maybe I haven't said that explicitly, but it was assumed so. So we expand the energy around the equilibrium positions. So U alpha one J one is an X direction displacement of the first atom. Uh, with respect to its equilibrium position. So equilibrium is defined by the lowest energy. That means the uh, minimum of the energy also with respect to changing of this coordinate. So the energy is, the minimum energy is obtained for U alpha one J one or U one X equal to zero, right? So that means that the, uh, at this equilibrium, at this position, the energy, the derivative of the total energy with respect to this coordinate must be equal to zero in order to have extremo. So we can actually neglect this or neglect this, this term becomes identically equal to zero. And all what we are left here are the second order terms. There's some constant energy and some higher order terms. So if you think about it, we have in case of one atom vibrating around its equilibrium position, uh, we have the total energy. So this would be the displacement, the total energy, and we are just describing the parabolic behavior of this, of this displacement. Parabolic, as long as we cut it after the second term or the harmonic term, if we would uh, include these higher order terms, then we say, okay, this might be uh, somehow unharmonic, might be uh, non-quadratic behavior. In any case, we say that a minimum, or more st strictly speaking, we say that the extremum appears at u equals to zero, right? That's where the linear term is. So if we want to have the e over the u, equal to zero, then necessarily the first derivative must be equal to zero right? because the linear term will become a constant term in this derivative. All right, 
So what can we do with this uh, uh, with this equation? What we will be doing uh, in the expressions in this lecture is that we will cut this Taylor expansion after the second term. And if we do so, and we call this the harmonic approximation, right? Harmonic, our potential, that means the energy as a function of displacement is a quadratic uh, function. If we want to describe this unharmonic effect, then we would end up with a potential as it's probably, uh, as it's for example shown here with this blue curve showing an, um, a schematic Morse potential uh, that describes some possibility for actually having a non-symmetrical displacement or in other words, if you would go to higher temperatures, so if we raise the temperature, that means we excite the, oh, this is a little bit color, if we excite the higher uh, energy state, then the equilibrium position would be shifting, right? This is the equilibrium position. And so if you then monitor the equilibrium position as a function of this excitation energy, which can be linked with the temperature, you get so-called thermal expansion. So thermal expansion is obtained only when the interaction between atoms or this uh, uh, potential well in which a pair of atoms uh, appears, if this is unharmonic. As long as it is harmonic, we do not get any thermal expansion. So if we strictly speaking cut out our material here, we will not get any thermal expansion. Um, for people who are deeply interested in this so-called quasi-harmonic approximation is a way how to use harmonic approximations on a series of different volumes and approximate them to get the unharmonic effects, not explicitly, but implicitly included. So let us now play around a little bit more with these harmonic oscillations and let's see what we can get out of it. So as I said, we'll be working with harmonic approximation. That means the total energy is cut after the uh, quadratic term, this Taylor expansion. We are missing here the linear term here. Uh, linear term is equal to zero because we do the expansion around the equilibrium position. And we start with the simplest possible system, and that is a one-dimensional chain of atoms, and all of these atoms are identical. So all of them have identical mass and are of identical species. That means all the bonds between them are also identical, and we will describe these bonds as harmonic oscillators, as springs with spring constant J. So when we want to write down the total energy of such system, we simply write the equilibrium energy of each of these bonds. We have n bonds, probably we, we assume that we have n bonds. Plus then we have here the uh, strain energy corresponding to the expansion of each of these bonds. If the two displacements of the two neighboring atoms are identical, they have the same size and the same direction, then their difference is zero, but that means that the distance between the two atoms with respect to their equilibrium distance does not change. And of course, there is no increase in the elastic energy, right? So that is also how to intuitively understand why in this energy term, we obtain the differences in the uh, displacements of individual atoms. In other words, these differences in the displacements of individual atoms describe the length change of the spring in between of them. The force constant, J, this is the central quantity here, which describes essentially the bond strength, uh, can be described or can be obtained by the second partial derivative of the energy with respect to the displacement. And uh, the first derivative of the energy with respect to displacement 
or a given set of displacements uh, will be uh, the force. Knowing the force, we can plug it into the second Newton's law and try to solve it. Um, we will work here with an ansatz of uh, traveling wave. So we will assume that our solution is in the form un equals, um, we have it, we take here a certain normalization vector, exponential function, n i k minus omega t. Okay, so uh, what do we say is that if we look at one certain atom, so we fix its position, so this part is going to be fixed, then the oscillations of these atoms are described as a harmonic oscillations. Right? So one single atom, the displacement of an atom with index n is harmonic. On the other hand, if we make a snapshot of the whole uh, of the whole system, we make a photograph, that means we fix the second part one time, then again, the wave that we will see as a function of position, and the position is described here by this a times k, come to the, uh, sorry, by the n times a, come to that in a second, will be again a harmonic, uh, a harmonic wave, right? So eventually, if instead of uh, n, and times a, you would get at this place, or you would write at this place r, then the function u tilde exponent i r times k is a harmonic function. This corresponds to some uh, cosine and sine functions. Right? Obviously, in this case, the uh, Amplitude expressed as uh, u tilde will be a complex number in order to get a real number describing the displacement. So uh, what can we learn from that? The equilibrium positions of each of these atoms are then expressed as a multiples of the equilibrium lattice spacing, equilibrium lattice constant. So this is essentially nothing else than the equilibrium distance in the atoms, right, before they start uh, vibrating. So this is the ansatz. This is why we call it an, a traveling wave, because each of these atoms uh, follows a harmonic oscillator. Uh, when we look at all of the atoms, we can put through there, uh, through the, so the easiest way, again, how maybe to draw this would be to look at the displacements in as, as a function of the position, which would bring us, how can I draw this easily here? Let me just go uh, kill this. Uh, it will put us to such a graph, right? That I now plot the displacements as a function of the position. So what you have here, are uh, just these numbers u n minus two, u n minus one, u n, and so on. And we have it at the positions n minus one, n minus, uh, sorry, n minus two, n minus one, n, and so on. So this is the index, the number of the atom. Right? And if you now replace this index of the atom, discrete part with a really continuous part, we can put through this a wave which will look like this. This is now the part, the, uh, the traveling wave that we want to see. Now, since each of these arrows changes in time, we can then say that this uh, atom in the next time step, in the next time when we make the snapshot, will be a bit shorter. This will be a bit shorter. This will be, uh, this, this will be probably a bit bigger. This will be bigger. This will be, this will be shorter, and so on. So our our wave will be essentially moving forward. Knowing this, we can now plug in this expression for 
displacement of an atom into this equation and try to play around with that. So maybe I'll do that on the following slide where you have the expression once again for the traveling wave written. So this is now our uh, ansatz for the solution. And let's try to plug it in into this uh, second Newton's law and see what we can get out of that. So on the one side, we had minus, uh, minus J times U N two times U N minus U N plus one minus U N minus one, right? And this equals M, which is the mass times the second derivative of the U N over E T. So this is the second Newton's law. Here we have the force equals mass times acceleration. That's all what we are writing. So let's now put this into all of these terms. What do we get here is minus J times U tilde K exponential function I N K minus omega t. I'm omitting here this uh, index k, probably I'll do it here as well to simplify the, so the, the uh, way how this looks like. And then we have here two times uh, nothing because un is already here in front of the uh, brackets minus two uh, minus, and here we would have exponential function of, uh, now we move with n to n plus one. So here it would be i a k minus exponential function minus i a k equals, and then what else do we have on the right-hand side? M times and the second derivative of the exponential function with respect to time would be giving us two times or actually squared the prefactor of the time, which is this part. So then we get here also minus, that's the I squared, omega squared, UK, Tilde, and I said that I'm not going to write the k right, uh, times exponential function i a and k minus omega t. Good. So that brings us already to the fact that we can uh, cancel out here some part, and namely this and this part. And we obtain a certain relay and uh, yeah, including these tilde and we obtain a certain relationship between the force constant, the mass, the frequency of the oscillations and k which describes the wave factor. So this was the length of the wave in our uh, static snapshot when we made the photograph of the vibrating atoms. We put this together we end up on the right-hand side with 2j times 1 minus cosine ka equals m omega squared. Where does the cosine come from? Well, you just would write that the exponential function i k a equals uh, cosine Ka minus i sine Ka and exponential function of minus i Ka equals cosine Ka plus i sine Ka. Right? So then we had these two things together. We sum them up. It means these terms cancel out. And from these two, we get two times cosine Ka, which is what we had. Then you would have to remember some basic relationships uh, between the trigonometric functions. 
intuit, figure out. Remember, I don't remember that anymore, but uh, maybe you do, that this is two times sine squared k a half which would overall bring us to the relationship that we have uh, four times j times sine k a half squared equals m omega squared. So we can put the m on the other side of the equation. And if you are interested in the omega, so in the frequency, you get that this is square root of 4j over m sine k a half or we put here 4j over m and absolute value of the sine k a r which should be hopefully the solution that we have there written as well in our lecture notes on the next line Exactly, all right. So what we have obtained is now that uh, for traveling wave to be a solution for our problem, there must hold a certain relationship between the wave vector and the frequency. There are some constants for uh, which, which come from the, let's say, uh, material properties such as the mass of an atom, the equilibrium spacing of the atoms, and the bond strength coming through this spring constant. Right? Uh, means that in order to observe a wave with a certain wavelength, when I make a snapshot, right? So my atoms sit, for example, here. I make a photograph and I see the atoms are uh, have displacements corresponding to these values. Then I have a certain wavelength, lambda. This is related to the wave vector k as 2 pi over lambda. Then in order to, for these atoms to really behave according to this equation and to fulfill our uh, linear chain model, the frequency with which the atoms go up and down, if I look now at one individual atom, are given by this value here. So this a relationship between the frequency, the vibrational frequency, and the wave vector is called dispersion curve and is often plotted uh, in such a graph. Here we now go with the uh, wave vector with k. Uh, basically from zero to infinity, and we plot it as a uh, function of the reciprocal length, uh, wave vector. Right? What else can we say about this? Um, there comes a bit of a terminology, such a vibrational mode that we have just described is called acoustic mode. And this is characteristic with omega, so the frequency going to zero as the wave vector goes to zero. And k vector going to zero means that the, uh, the wavelength goes to infinity. Once again, the relationship between the wave vector and the wavelength is reciprocal. And if the Wavelength goes, uh, wavelength goes to infinity. That means if I make a snapshot of all my atoms, I will not see the sinusoidal dependence of the displacement, but I will eventually see that all atoms are displaced by the same amount. And so for the acoustic mode, I would see that all the atoms move together. Right? So this would be this harmonic motion that would be what describes my, my so-called acoustic mode. Up to now, 
we have considered only the interactions between the nearest neighbors, right? So uh, essentially in the chain, the contribution to the energy was coming only from a spring between the two nearest neighbors. But there is no reason to think about it quantum mechanically or chemically, why not to include also more distant interactions? Probably this atom also interacts with the atom number three. It is very, very likely that its interaction is weak, but we have no tool to say that we can neglect it to start with. Right? So what we can do is essentially to add this higher order or more distant interactions exactly by the same way as we added the first nearest interactions, which were described by all having the, uh, by, by all described by springs with the same spring constant. Now, since all the atoms are identical or uh, at the same distance, of course, the interaction between atom one and three is the same one as between two and four and so on. So we would simply call this J2, meaning that we have the interaction of the second nearest neighbors. The whole uh, formal expression becomes identical. We only have now the, uh, the sum over all of these springs becomes a double sum where we have a sum over all different interactions. So from my given atom to the nearest neighbors to the second nearest neighbors, third nearest neighbor, and so on. And then over all atoms. It would again lead to the same um, Newton's law, to the same uh, Newton's equation of uh, motion, which can be solved. And eventually the solution will become now more difficult or more complex than what we had before. Instead of simply having the uh, square root of 4j over m and then the absolute value of this uh, sine function, we would now get that the expression for the omega as a function of k is more complicated. What is the consequence of this more complicated uh, relationship is the fact that while for the nearest neighbor interaction, the relationship always looks the way that we see it on this graph. It can be only differently scaled and along the x-axis, right? So, uh, sorry, along the y-axis by this prefactor, but other than that, it's always the same. Uh, this freedom uh, the, or the, this uh, additional or longer range interactions bring a freedom in the shapes of this, uh, of this dispersion relationship. So it will always contain the acoustic mode, always goes to zero as k goes to zero that we can see obviously from here. And also there will be always an extremum of this frequency at the Brillouin zone boundary. So when we put k equals pi over a in this equation, we'll always get that the derivative of omega with respect to k at this Brillouin zone boundary is equal to zero. So that's the same behavior as once again, uh, we could see, it's always going there and back, we could see in this graph that at k equals to zero, we have omega goes to zero, and at the Brillouin zone boundary here at pi over a, we have the derivative equal to zero. So this is the same type of behavior. Now with the additional uh, longer range interactions, we might get that essentially this may, may look more complicated, right? Something like that. So as it's written here, it's beyond the nearest neighbor interactions opens a possibility for more complex shapes of the dispersion curves. In other words, for more complicated relationships between the omega frequency and the K vector. What about these K vectors? Uh, what are the allowed uh, values? 
we want to describe the atoms by a traveling wave. And obviously the two waves, which are shown on this figure here, the thin one, which I will try to highlight in blue, and the thick one, which I try to highlight now in red, they are two different waves. If you look at water surface, you will be able to say whether your wavelength is longer or shorter. Definitely you would be able to do. Now think about our atoms, right? We are coming down, 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 and all what we see are really just these vibrating walls atoms. So all what I see here is that at this position is an atom going up and down and here up and down and up and down and up and down. Good. And I make a snapshot, make a photograph. What I will see are those guys here. I will not see the wave which goes through them. Right? That means that I look at it and I say, okay, uh, probably those are vibrating atoms, and perhaps I can describe their behavior using this traveling wave. So let me put through them an equation which describes them, this wave. So I put through them the function ur, which is what we just did before, right, as the u tilde exponential function i. Uh, R K, and here we have some other part u omega t. So that sh should be as well exponential function, All right? So good. I make a snapshot. That means this is a constant. Here we have a constant, and I'm essentially trying to fit through these guys one function, um, a continuous function, continuous function of the variable r of the position through these positions. But eventually I'm trying to fit really a continuous function of the position where I know the displacement only on a set of discrete values. And it would actually turn out exactly from for the argument that you see in this picture that there is not a unique way how to do this. I will manage to do that with my blue wave vector, which I have just shown here. And I would manage to do the same fitting also with the red wave vector. Okay. So that means that I would get two different functions, U, R, blue and red one, but these functions would be identical at the positions of the atoms. And eventually this is all what, all what matters, right? Because I'm trying to use a continuous picture to describe discrete values. I eventually do not care about uh, how does this function behave in between of the atoms as long as at their positions, it does the proper job. So both of these descriptions with the blue and the red wave vector, are for my purpose equivalent. The question is, is there any relationship between the blue and red wave vector? And the answer is, yes, there is. Actually, in that case, what we had, I think the red, we had the, the shorter one, right? So that would be that 2K equals the blue wave vector, right? So if you look at it, uh, this is the blue wave, uh, sorry, this, this is the blue wave vector. And what I just shown here with the first one was two times the short wave wave vector. And so the, uh, I said, sorry, it's not K, right? Uh, well, it's here incorrectly. It's uh, two times lambda equals the blue lambda, the wavelength really. It means in terms of the wave vectors, two times K blue blue k vector is 
the red wave vector. Mm -hmm. So if I find out what is the longest wavelength with which I can describe my system, I will then be able to find a fractional wavelength such as wavelength, which is one half or one third and so on, which will always fit more oscillations in between of the identical, uh, identical displacement. I can think about an absolutely crazy function, which would go like that, right? With a lot of vibrations with very short wavelength that describes identical displacements of the atoms. And this, the uh, green one is actually given by uh, a fraction that it is, uh, how shall we write it? The green one is a fraction of the red one, one over n lambda. That means the green wave vector is n times the red wave vector. And and red was not the shortest one. So I take this back again. I should not have here the red ones. I do it the blue, but the blue is the longer one, right? So I take again that this is one over n lambda, and this means n times the blue k vector, right? So if I'm able to describe my traveling wave with a certain k vector, I'm able to describe it also with any k vector, which is uh, shifted, and actually this, this again is not correct, right? It's not multiple, but it's shifted by a, a, a reciprocal lattice vector. So that's incorrect. We should have that the red one. Now I managed to confuse you properly, right? Is k plus a g vector. G is the reciprocal vector. And maybe in order to show this, we can, we can try to write it again as an equation to see that what is happening. So what if I now take an equation, where again, I say that I can describe this with a certain value. A, K, A plus omega T. Right. And now what if I take a wave vector, which is shifted, so we take K prime, which is shifted by a reciprocal wave vector. What will happen? And we are trying to write this as a red wave vector. So then we get that the, for the, uh, red wave vector, we get that this u n exponential function i n k prime a plus omega t equals u tilde exponential function i n k a plus g a n g a plus omega t, and there should be the parentheses only here, all right? So all what I have done now is to write here the k prime, out of which we see that this now equals to u prime exponential function of i n k a plus omega t times exponential function of i g a n times, All right? And in this first part, we now realize that this is u that was our blue expression for the, uh, for the displacement of an atom. And in the second part, we now have to realize what does it mean to have a reciprocal lattice vector? 
g equals 2 pi over a and it's all one dimensional so this is this is the length of it times a certain number integer number so what we end up here with this second part because of running of space i write it now just in green here it's the exponential function of i then we have n times m times 2 pi over a times a. And so this obviously cancels out. Both n and m are integer numbers. And so we end up here with exponential function of 2 pi integer number times pi, which is equal to 1. So what we have done is that we just showed that the description of the displacements given by a k vector, k prime, which is k plus g, where g is a reciprocal lattice vector, gives identical description for the displacements of individual atoms. Right? That means that out of the whole dispersion relationship where we have the dependence of omega on all the reciprocal vectors, all the uh, values of k, we can restrict ourselves only for k vectors from the first Brillouin zone. Because whenever I go to the second Brillouin zone or third Brillouin zone, we are actually shifting from the first Brillouin zone vector by a lattice vector, and we know that this will lead to a wave description that the wave itself is different, but the displacement of individual discretely spaced atoms are identical. You could see that, obviously this is not a proof, but it is something that maybe makes you believe it already from this graph. And when we said that this is the Berlin zone boundary, that would be the another one here at the minus pi over i. Obviously, it goes like that. So then if I move by a reciprocal lattice vector from here to there, or two times the nearest, uh, two times the spacing between the uh, reciprocal, the, the brilliant zones, uh, I get identical omega. I get identical uh, description of the lattice vibrations. If I move from here, by the reciprocal lattice vector, I come here to here. Right? If I move from any of these positions, I get the identical description. So obviously, all the k vectors are allowed, but those which make uh, sense to describe in order to get unique lattice vibrations, to get unique solutions, uh, they are restricted to the K vectors from the first Brillouin zone. This is called reduced wave vectors. And this is what we will be using from now on. Another thing is to believe or to, to think about which values of the K vectors are really applicable. If you would think about just a pair of atoms vibrating, um, these pair of atoms. They are connected with one spring. This is what we did in principle last week as well. There would be one single harmonic oscillator. What is the frequency of this harmonic oscillator? Well, this is fixed, right? There is no other mode. There is just one lattice vibration. Okay. Uh, what if we now talk about three atoms, right? So I would have three balls. Then I can describe the lattice vibrations of those by two atoms uh, being still and the third one vibrating away from them, or two atoms at the corner being still and the one in the middle is uh, being displaced there and back or going there and back. So there I would get two different K vectors, two different plane waves. Each of these would correspond to a different frequency of the vibrations, right? One of them would be probably slower, the other one would be faster. 
Uh, and so I can continue. So if I now think about an infinitely long crystal, I can try to apply periodic boundary conditions because I say if I have a crystal then um, in a certain distance from me, I do have to have the same displacement of an atom. And that would lead me to the condition, this application of the periodic boundary conditions, that the applicable values of the K vector, those values that I can take from the first Brillouin zone, are only integer multiples by 2 pi over Na, where 2 pi over A is the size of the Brillouin zone, and N is the number of atoms in my linear chain. Or if I then go to three dimensions, then N would correspond to the number of uh, unit cells in my sample. Right? So eventually, uh, if we really think about a realistic sample with billions of atoms, then the number N is so large that eventually the allowed values of the K vector along the reciprocal, lattice, uh, reciprocal axis uh, are filling so-called quasi-continuum. They are discrete because the atomic structure is discrete because we have only finite number of atoms and finite number of unit cells. But at the same time, their number is so large, that their spacing in between of them is so small that we can't really resolve it. Between any two of them, we'll find another one. So then we essentially describe the lattice vibrations with a continuous uh, with a continuous axis uh, k. Uh, a quick question. Yes. Uh, sorry. 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 Maybe. It's too, no. Can you can you ask the question? But try to shout. It's very. Yes. Sad. Uh, is this the Bohr correspondence principle? With uh, increasing n, you get to uh, a continuum of. I don't know whether the others can can hear that, but I can very barely hear that. Maybe can you write the question in the in the chat quickly? Bohr correspondence principle. I have to admit that I've never heard this connection correspondence principle, but indeed it has something to do with the born Karman uh, boundary conditions. So probably we speak about the same thing, and this is this is exactly it. That's also the same thing, but the same reason why for the electronic uh, for the electronic density of states, we essentially will be speaking about the quasi continuum of the k vectors for for electrons. Does that answer your question? Probably not yet. Yeah, good. Um, we take the homework, both of us. You look at the born kalman periodic boundary conditions. I look at the or correspondence principle and we try to reach agreement, okay? Good. All right, so thanks for teaching me. <laughs> Uh, what happens when we have more than a single atom in the basis? That means in our unit cell, we have more atoms typically with uh, um, either different masses or they become by symmetry non-equivalent, right? Then uh, we do write the same type of equations, the same type of uh, expansion for each of the atom in the unit cell. So this is now our unit cell. Uh, in this particular case, we now say we have two different atoms, but the bonds between them are all the same. We can have also another case that we would have the same type of atoms, but we would have different bonds, right? J1, J2, J1, and J2 again. 
there would be uh, the same kind of an expression uh, or the same kind of a situation, just with a slightly different expression uh, to what we are going to do here. So when we do, we apply exactly the same tools and I will now not wait, uh, spend so much time with it here. Uh, we then write the uh, equation, the, the second Newton's equation of motion uh, for each of these species with capital M and small m. So presumably this is the capital M and small m, two masses um, alternating. And when we solve it, we now get an uh, interesting situation. We again apply the same uh, ansatz for the solution. We obtain a very interesting thing. Basically for each K, we now get up to two different values. So we get two, but they might be degenerate. So we get up to two different values for the omega. This is interesting. So our dispersion relationship changes. To something like this. Right? We have here still the acoustic wave as we had it before. And on top of that, we get something which we will be calling an optic wave, an optic branch of the solution. So what is this optic branch? How is that related to the acoustic branch? Or what would be the acoustic branch? And for that, I come back to the previous slide. There was this picture. We can think about a wave that can go through both of these types of atoms together. That would correspond to so-called acoustic branch. Or we can think about the same wave, but uh, one of the, well, this way, one, one wave goes through this one type of atoms and the inverse wave goes through the uh, other type of atoms. So to describe the positions of the small atoms, we will take basically a function which is minus the position of the large atoms at the respective positions. So this is now at the position of the uh, small atoms, for example, right? This is Rn, so this is capital R. Good. Uh, what does that really mean? is that if you think about the displacement of the uh, one atom and the other atom, so in the case that they vibrate all together, so there is some uh, displacement of uh, the center of mass of the two atoms, and we're describing the acoustic modes, whereas for the optic modes, they go with the opposite, uh, with the opposite displacements, right? So the atoms go, in the opposite directions. Um, that means that their center of mass stays still. If I look at the, uh, for example, if I look here at my unit cell, then if the atoms, the orange or the purple one and the blue one, if they go in the opposite directions, then the center of mass, this whole unit cell, uh, sorry, of, the, of this pair of atoms remains the same. If on the other hand, they both go in the same direction, then the center of mass keeps moving. That would be describing the acoustic modes. The first case when they go in the opposite direction describes the optic modes. The optic modes are characterized by much higher frequencies. That is what you see in here. And especially for the gamma point for k equals to zero, then the optic modes are significantly higher than the acoustic modes. Once again, what does this mean? For k equals to zero, for the gamma point, the wavelength is infinitely long. That means 
in the picture that we have here. Instead of having this wavelength, we will have all the uh, large atoms at one position and all the small atoms also at the same plane. And these two planes go in the opposite directions. This corresponds to wavelength infinity or k equal to zero. If both of them go in the same direction, then I have the green ones here and the blue ones here, for example, and all of them go in the same direction, the same displacement. Yeah? Again, for lambda equals to zero. So if this is the case, then in principle, the whole crystal moves as a whole, right? All atoms are displaced by the same amount. That means that there is no returning force on the atoms. If you think about it, if you take all your atoms and you displace all of them by the same amount, their mutual display, their mutual distances do not change. There is no reason for the atoms to come back to the original position, their original absolute position. Means that the returning force is zero. And the time that it will take for the system to come back is infinite. Means the omega, the frequency of this oscillation, which is two times over the period of this vibration is gonna be zero. And this is exactly the characteristic thing for the acoustic mode. Whereas in the other case here, when I have that they go in the opposite direction, then despite the fact that overall the distance between the same types of atoms do not change, what changes is the distance, the separation between the different types of atoms, between the large and the small ones. And of course, it results in a result uh, in a returning force. So even if I now take all the large atoms and the small atoms and I displace them in, a, in an opposite direction, there will be a returning force to bring them back again. And therefore, even for k equal to zero, that means the infinite lambda, infinite wavelength, where all the large atoms go in one direction and the, all the small atoms go in the other direction, I will still get returning force, to my equilibrium. And as a consequence of that, it will take only a finite time to come back. And consequently, the frequency with which this system will vibrate will be non-zero. So this is the intuitive way how to understand the relationship at k equals to zero. Uh, the two frequencies that we get here at uh, the Grillin tone boundary, they correspond to individual solutions. So they correspond to the fact that I keep one of the uh, atoms still and the other guys are shifting with non-zero uh, wave vector. So one goes up, one goes down and so on. And the other solution is then the opposite. So I keep the small atoms fixed and the large atoms move uh, and they are alternating with their um, displacements from one to another ruling zone. The two frequencies are different if the two atoms are different. So if uh, one atom has different mass from the uh, first type of atoms. So what happens when we try to generalize this to 3D case? Nothing will change from the uh, conceptual point of view and everything will change from the uh, way how this is written and how the solution works, right? It will just become more difficult. So if you look at the equation that we have here, this is exactly the same equation as we started with for the uh, linear one-dimensional chain. 
we have here the equilibrium energies of individual bonds, where now J label atoms in the unit cell. In that case, when we had single atomic species, then J and J, J prime would just go over one atom. There is just one atom in the unit cell. And R and R prime are now vectors, which tells us uh, which unit cell in the whole series of chains, uh, in, the, in the whole chain of unit cells we are talking about. So essentially these would be the indices of the atoms we had for the monatomic chain. Right? So monatomic chain, like that, and R would be equal to N, and J is always equal to one. When we had the diatomic chain, in the previous example with these blue and purple equations, uh, atoms, then R is still labeling the unit cells and J equals either one or two. This would be small atoms and this is large atoms. Now imagine a general 3D case where we have somehow to label the uh, unit cells in three dimensions. So either we can, of course, uh, say how far we go along X, Y, and Z, and we will put here, instead of N, we will put there I, X, I, Y, I, Z, the three indices, which somehow tell us how far are we from our unit cell when we go far away, or we simply label them by a positional vector, and this positional vector is the lattice vector, right? If you think about uh, or remember the lecture number one, when we said <clears throat> each crystal is defined by a lattice, a virtual lattice, which provides us with a series of translational symmetries. And then on top of that, we put there a motif, a basis into each of these lattice points. And R, capital R, are the lattice points and J in this uh, labels all the atoms in the, in the basis and the motif. So obviously here we have the uh, equilibrium energies of all of, all of all of these interactions. Once again, for only considering the nearest uh, interactions, then R and R prime would be chosen so that they are only from the uh, nearest neighbor cells. And here, what do we have? Well, again, our well-known quadratic term, where we have the strength of the interaction, labeling types of the atoms, and the indices of the cells, right? So we can have, of course, the interaction between the atoms within one cell, means R and R prime are the same vectors or between the same atom, J and J prime are the same, but in different unit cells where R and R prime would be. And then the second part of uh, this equation here, uh, this is nothing else than the change of the distance between these two atoms. And we would again use exactly the same uh, ansatz for the uh, solution. It only looks a little bit more complicated, but in fact, it is not. So here we have some eigenvectors which correspond to the directions of displacements of individual atoms. K vector describes the wave uh, length and the direction of propagation of this wave in a 3D model, again, in the 3D continuum model. R is the lattice vector. So this is the uh, position, how far we are in the, uh, in the space from one cell to the other cell. And in these prefectors here, as well as in the actual eigenvectors, we would get how does the displacement change from one atom to the other atom inside of the unit cell. The, number of vibrational modes 
is corresponding to the number of atoms in the unit cell times the dimensionality of our program. So up to now, we have explored two cases. We have explored one dimensional monatomic case that was one dimensional and one atom. And if you remember, we obtained just one branch in the uh, dispersion relationship. Right? And we had a one dimensional diatomic chain. It means we had two atoms in one dimension and we obtained two different vibrational modes. One was acoustic, one was optic. In 3D case, we would have three times the number of atoms in the unit cell. So if you think, for example, about FCC aluminum, aluminum has one atom in the unit cell and the dispersion relationship would contain three branches. Three because we have three dimensional and one because we have one atom in the unit cell. If you think about silicon, silicon has two atoms in the unit cell. If you remember, we took the FCC cell and then put there a basis where the two silicon atoms were uh, placed along the body diagonal. Then we would have from this e expression here, we would obtain expect to obtain six different branches. Again, six corresponding to three, three dimensions times two to the number of atoms. Out of all of these branches, we will have some acoustic, some optic modes. And on top of that, we will have also so-called longitudinal and transverse modes. The K vector now describes the direction of motion of the wave. Uh, the eigenvectors here will have a certain relationship with respect to the direction of motion. It is something which comes only with higher uh, dimensionality of the problem. In 1D, of course, the atoms could move only along one, along one axis, right? So there was not anything about uh, longitudinal or acoustic modes. But now um, we can think about that the uh, one atoms, and let us just consider, for example, these solid lines here that correspond to the <clears throat> one type of atoms. And uh, this part here corresponds to the wavelength. So that's is two pi over the k vector. The k is actually a k vector. So the direction of k says, what is the direction of propagation of the wave? In which direction it goes, right? Uh, the length of the k vector says something about the wavelength. And the term longitudinal or transverse says about the displacement direction with respect to the uh, propagation of the wave. Longitudinal means that the atoms move along the uh, direction of the propagation. Transverse means that they move perpendicular to the propagation. Actually, what I was drawing a few slides back for the one dimensional case, when I plotted on the x axis, the index of the atom and on the y-axis I was plotting the UK, uh, the displacements of individual atoms, just to show you how can I put through the displacements the traveling wave. Right? I was on purpose plotting this, that the displacements were perpendicular to the axis uh, of the uh, corresponding to the position of atoms. And I did this so that I could nicely show this wave. But this was not corresponding to how we plotted the one dimensional chain in which actually the displacements were all were all in this in this uh, along the axis, right? Uh, the only reason is that such displacements, such a longitudinal wave, is not so easy to be shown, to be demonstrated with uh, uh, the wave equation. Now for 3D, this is very obvious what that could mean. 
right? So the longitudinal waves, they mean that along the wave direction, I actually change the density of the lattice planes. Some of the lattice planes come closer together. Some of them are become more distant. And I do change, I, I do change the density of, the, um, uh, of these lattice planes. For the transverse, I just move them uh, in a direction which is perpendicular to this direction of propagation. Finally, I can talk about acoustic waves where all of the uh, atoms are actually displaced in the same direction or along the, uh, uh, along the optic, uh, optic modes. Well, again, I would have in the unit cell two different types of atoms, symmetry different atoms, and they would be described by the two different displacement uh, waves, right? So what is shown here is actually the point that these two planes, the, all of these atoms are identical here, and we have now uh, the wavelength which corresponds to here, and, and essentially, we do not see any optic modes because all the atoms are identical. If now these guys were red and maybe these guys would be blue, then we would have uh, essentially in this case a longitudinal uh, optic mode. So we have again the two types of atoms which uh, are we, whose displacements go in the opposite directions. I think I'm talking too much here about the basics. So let's come to some examples. Uh, wow, what has just happened? Uh, what we have here, are examples of some 3D dispersion relationships. So we have here, first of all, an FCC neon, for example, and then we have another FCC material. You see that qualitatively, they look very similar. They have the acoustic modes that come to zero here. Uh, each of these corresponds to one longitudinal and two transverse modes. The longitudinal modes here result in uh, higher frequencies than the transverse modes. What we have on the x-axis, we uh, sample the reciprocal brilliant zone, reciprocal zone, so the brilliant zone, we sample along different directions. And for each of these k vectors, we get a set of frequencies. In the case when we do not go along uh, the symmetry lines, so or we go along lower symmetry lines, then we get three different frequencies, such as here, for example. When we go along high symmetry lines, when the two transverse modes, in this particular case, become identical, then uh, the frequencies are degenerate. Again, what does this mean? Well, you look at the vibrations along the z-axis, right? So your, uh, your atoms either vibrate uh, along the z-axis this way, or they vibrate along the x-axis, or they vibrate along the y-axis. Now, obviously the x and y direction both of them are perpendicular to the z-direction, so that's the propagation of the wave. Both of them are identical. So there is no reason why, if I would look at the vibrating x-planes or y-planes, why they should vibrate with different frequency. That is the reason why they become, uh, why they become degenerate here, right? So I still do have three branches. It's just that I don't see them in this dispersion relationship because two of them along all of these K vectors, they yield identical frequencies. And they only split when I now go along 
a different direction. So I looked at the propagation along different direction. And I would then uh, start monitoring the frequencies again of the transfers and the longitudinal modes separately. When we look at materials with the same crystal symmetry, the shape of this dispersion relationship is very similar. Right? So this is really given by uh, mostly by the crystal symmetry. We also see here that in both of these cases, we have just three branches and three acoustic branches. Acoustic because all of them have the frequencies going to zero as K goes to the gamma points, K goes to the zero. If we look at a different symmetry or different crystal structure, BCC, we have an example of potassium, and we look at the dispersion relationship, it looks different now. It looks different than these two, and it's given mostly because of the different arrangement of atoms, the different number of nearest neighbors, the different number of the springs, that represent the interactions between the atoms. The similarity between FCC and BCC, in this case between, let's say, neon and potassium, stems from the fact that both of them have in the unit cell one atom. And consequently, both of them contain only uh, three acoustic modes. Right? There are no optic modes here because all of those structures are described with a unit cell with single atom. When we look at FCC structure, which then contains two atoms, we have here an example of sodium chloride, then we finally obtain the optic modes. Once again, the optic modes mean that the displacements of atoms are described by the uh, waves, by the transverse waves, with opposite signs. If we now look at the acoustic branches of sodium chloride and neon, they are topologically the same, right? We have that the two transverse modes are degenerate along the OO1 direction in the reciprocal space, then they start splitting. That's exactly what we see here. On top of that, we get also the longitudinal and transverse modes uh, for the optic branches. What would happen if I have theoretically in the unit cell three atoms? How many branches do I get then? I will get three branches for the three atoms times three, because I think about three dimensional crystals, so I will get nine branches. Out of these nine branches, there will be three acoustic and six optic modes. In other words, there will be three branches which go to zero as K approaches zero, as K approaches the gamma point, the center of the reciprocal space. And all the rest will be non-zero as I approach the gamma point. I would like to make a connection now between these acoustic waves and the elastic properties of materials. Right? Uh, actually, uh, we'll be dealing with this also in the other lecture that I'm having these days about the elasticity and dislocation. So you can visit also this course uh, where we talk a lot about strain tensors describing the the formation of material and stresses corresponding to the forces uh, acting on the unit cell. And from the uh, continuum elasticity theory, these are connected via Hooke's law. And if we think about the linear elasticity, then the Hooke's law can be expressed in this form. Simply the, the strains are linearly, sorry, the stresses, the forces, are linearly dependent on the strains. Now, what are the strains? The strains are functions of the displacement. So if I have 
certain displacement field for describing really the deformation, then the strain, for example, epsilon xx, is given as a derivative of u x x with respect to x. Okay. All of this you have probably seen before and is given uh, as the basics of the elasticity theory. If you now take the general definition of the strain as the epsilon ij equals one half of displacement component i with respect to xj plus d j over d x i. So this is now how does the displacement field change with respect to the position in the uh, undeformed body? And you plug this in, in here and try to express the stresses, the forces acting on a unit volume using the Hooke's law. And finally, place the stresses into the equilibrium condition for elastic medium. You will get on the right hand side an equation which connects the uh, derivative of the gradient of the displacement field and elastic constants, describing the sort of uh, bond strength of the atoms. And on the left hand side, there will be the time derivative of the displacement. Rho here means the mass density, and that is essentially related to the uh, mass that we had in our uh, atomic vibrational equation before. So this is the continuum equivalent of our wave function we had before. So we can try to apply here the same ansatz for the solution and put there again the wavelength, uh, the, the wave solution in, into here. And when we do that, we think about some special waves. That means uh, the k vectors oriented along some certain directions and also a certain displacements, for example, a longitudinal wave for x going to zero, uh, sorry, for, uh, for the displacement field along the x-axis. And then finally, we take the long wavelength limit for k equals to zero. We would obtain <coughs> that the uh, relationship between omega and k is dependent on the mass density, rho, and the elastic constant. Looks like far away from everything we've been talking here uh, so far. But, okay, we don't have it here. But all what it means is that if we now forget about the atoms, sorry for this flipping, them here. If we forget about the atoms, we now try to think about the material as a continuum. And instead of displacing atom one, atom two, atom three, and we say that displacement is a continuous function, and we think about this elastic wave in the limit of long wavelength limit, that means k equals to goes to zero, lambda goes to infinity, then all what we have said is that the longitudinal wave, the omega over k should be c11 over square root of c11 over rho. In other words, in this region, when we now fit the relationship between omega and k vector with a linear relationship, and obviously not in the whole range, but in the range near to the uh, gamma point, then the slope that we have here 
is given by the elastic constant. And elastic constant is something which is well known to you. At least I hope so. Uh, mass density is also a quantity which you have met already at the high school. And all of a sudden we have here a connection between something very atomistic and even the relationships that we obtained here, we actually linked to the individual relationships between atoms, their interactions and the bond strength. And something very macroscopic, such as elastic constants and the mass density. We have tools to measure dispersion relationships. And out of here, you can obtain the elastic constants. You can measure the elastic constants by fitting the dispersion relationships of the phonons, of the lattice vibrations, uh, the acoustic phonons near to the gamma point. So from here, you would get the C11 elastic constant of neon out of this dispersion relationship you would get the C11 for sodium chloride. If you now look at different directions, how you can approach the gamma point, it means you look at the waves in different directions. And sorry again for this. Here we have now the different directions, 100, 111, 110 or 111. So that means we have the different directions of the propagation of the waves with respect to the uh, crystal lattice. Then the longitudinal and transverse modes are described by a different relationship between the omega and the k vector. Right? So in this case, it means that the omega squared times rho equals, and whatever we have here, I label this as constant A, times the k squared. So for a longitudinal wave along the 100 directions, when we are approaching the gamma point uh, for these waves, we have the A equal to C11. For transverse waves, we can measure the C44 constant. For other directions, we can measure other elastic constants. 